delighted to be part of continuing the dialogue uh, as I think uh, my colleague Dr. Solomon just outlined. Uh, this is a part of a very broad dialogue involving many different areas of many different medicines. <clears throat> I think that uh, we all agree that antibiotic treatments have been critical in human and veterinary medicine for a very long time, more than 60 years. Unfortunately, antimicrobial resistance has been a challenge for almost as long. As uh, my colleague uh, said, it just it emerges in settings where antimicrobials are used. It emerges in a variety of bacteria, viruses, fungi, and parasites when they are treated with specific uh, drugs. Um, and it sometimes spreads from one bacterial strain to another, observed in the late 40s in Japan when antibiotics were introduced to treat Shigella infections, dysentery, that was a big problem then. Uh, it was noted that the genetic material that coded for resistance, uh, DNA itself was, was really not quite appreciated, but it was, a, it was observed that the, something was being transferred uh, from one Shigella to another, and ultimately that was the plasmids that were discovered then. And the resistance has become a central issue for managing infections of all kinds. Uh, it's hard for me to think of a, an issue that better exemplifies the, uh, uh, the need for One Health uh, thinking as a way to approach it um, and One Health um, uh, dialogue uh, between uh, human and animal medicine and the environment across the world. The report that was released that uh, Dr. Solomon just summarized for you on September 17th highlighted the particular issues around 18 pathogens uh, with uh, the burden of uh, over 2 million illnesses, 23,000 deaths. Among those 18, four <clears throat> are often transmitted through foods or foodborne associated ones. Two of the four uh, we recognize major animal reservoirs as the ultimate source for most of those infections. And two, uh, clearly have human reservoirs with little or no participation uh, from the animal world. And we, uh, as part of that report, we separately estimated the burden for each of the infections. Uh, and so here, are the, those four agents broken out in a little bit more detail. And here I'm using a, a sort of a special definition of uh, the word resistant. This is not resistance to any antimicrobial at all, but resistant to uh, principal clinical agents that are used for the treatment of the infection in humans. So one pathogen, for instance, was Campylobacter, the bacterial pathogen Campylobacter. 24% uh, of the strains in the United States in humans now are, are resistant to one of the principal clinical agents that might be used for treatment. That adds up to 310,000 illnesses a year and about 28 uh, deaths a year estimated. Non-typhoidal salmonella is the second. Uh, resistance levels somewhat lower, but a substantial number of illnesses and uh, an appreciable number of deaths. Now, they're the two pathogens that come next are the two that have human reservoirs. Salmonella typhi, that's the sera the, the serovar biovar of salmonella, which has a human reservoir, human host, and is largely acquired while traveling in the third world. There's a lot of resistance in what's out there in the third world, uh, and most infections in this country are quite resistant. Um, and Shigella, the bacillary dysentery, uh, again has a human reservoir, human host, and transmits uh, human to human and Resistance, it, there's a lot of resistance in Shigella. 6% is resistant to the current recommended therapy. <clears throat> so the total is uh, a little over 400,000 illnesses uh, and uh, 60, 70 deaths. Uh, a really appreciable number of illnesses, fortunately not uh, a, a huge number of deaths. Now, we track the problem of antimicrobial resistance uh, in, in humans at CDC, we've been tracking it for a long time. Back in the 70s, we did periodic surveys of Salmonella or Shigella using a, uh, a, a volunteer panel of counties uh, every five years or so. In the 1980s, uh, uh, when there were a number of outbreaks of highly resistant infections, 
uh, observed uh, and concern rose. This ultimately led in 1996 to the formation of the what we call NARMS, the National Antimicrobial Resistance Monitoring System for Enteric Bacteria. This is actually a, a collaborative effort uh, uh, for me. This I can say this is uh, One Health really became very real for me here. The uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, samples, uh, uh, collects uh, bacteria from animals. The FDA Center for Veterinary Medicine studies samples from retail meats, and CDC uh, tests the samples from human clinical cases. We get the human and animal strains into this system from all 50 states, the retail food isolates from 14 states, and they're tested all using exactly the same uh, uh, methods and testing, so they're very comparable. Uh, against standard panels of antimicrobial agents, and there's a, uh, a website where the annual reports give you a, a great deal of detail. Now, we track a number of bacteria in NARMS. Um, across the whole system, we track uh, the uh, non-typhoidal Salmonella and Campylobacter, and then depending on the source, we can uh, look at other things as well. Uh, at CDC, we've been looking at the typhoid fever agent, Salmonella typhi, since 99 and Shigella since 1999, and uh, we also look at the Vibrios that uh, have a, a, an environmental reservoir in our, our water systems uh, where we grow oysters. <clears throat> um, these are, as I say, these are, are tested in the different laboratories using exactly the same methods so that we can compare uh, trends and, tr and track the, uh, the developments. Now, um, what we've seen, um, starting before NARMS, is the appearance of highly resistant strains that have really been of concern, particularly in Salmonella and Campylobacter. In the 1980s, there were substantial outbreaks, uh, uh, typically linked to foods that uh, were related to the dairy and beef reservoirs, uh, with uh, a level of resistance, ampicillin, uh, chloramphenicol, uh, canamycin, and tetracycline, um, that were uh, of concern in the 90s, typhimurium, a particular type that the British labeled DT-104, again in the dairy and beef reservoirs, uh, was even more resistant. In the late 1990s, a Salmonella Newport strain appeared in the dairy and beef uh, uh, reservoirs in the northeast New England area and then spread across the country that was uh, even more resistant. And it has, uh, for the first time, uh, I'm going to mention the CMY2 gene, which is a uh, particular gene that confers resistance uh, to uh, the, the third-generation cephalosporins like uh, 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 ceftifur or ceftriaxone. Uh, in the late 1990s, Campylobacter jejuni resistance to uh, the fluoroquinolone agents, the, the ciprofloxacin being the human agent, appeared, uh, uh, and uh, NARMS could see it happening in the poultry and in, in the isolates from humans at the same time. Uh, and in the 2000s, uh, more recently, Salmonella Heidelberg uh, related to poultry with uh, a number of resistance patterns of concern. And again, that CMY2 gene I'm going to talk about a little bit more. In recent years, uh, multi-state outbreaks of resistant Salmonella infections have tended to uh, uh, grab headlines and have tended to uh, concern public health greatly. Uh, when an outbreak occurs that's uh, spread across a number of states uh, and uh, when it's traced back to, to a particular food, uh, sometimes that leads <clears throat> um, to a recall. Sometimes that leads to uh, real concern on the part of public health and uh, 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 the, the regulatory agencies and the industry itself. There's been a ground beef outbreak, uh, multi-resistant typhimurium, rather resistant uh, in 2010 and 2011, 12, and 13, we've had outbreaks of Heidelberg related to poultry sources uh, that have had several different resistant uh, patterns, the most recent ones having actually being collections of different uh, strains all transmitting at the, in the same way with a variety of different uh, patterns, sometimes no resistance at all. So that's the sort of thing that does make public health concern. Uh, large outbreaks, uh, uh, numbers of illnesses. What, is, what connects um, the antibiotic use in animals with human health anyway? Well, there are several steps in the logic, and each of the steps has been examined in a number of different places with a number of different pa uh, uh, particular strains of either Salmonella or Campylobacter, but it's very clear. It's no mystery 
the use of antibiotics in food-producing animals can select for antibiotic-resistant bacteria, including ones that are going to be pathogenic to humans. We know that bacteria can be transmitted from food-producing animals to humans through the food supply, and resistant bacteria are no different than other bacteria in that regard. And resistant bacterial pathogens can cause illness in humans rather readily. And then the infections caused by resistant bacteria <clears throat> can result in adverse health consequences for humans. And uh, that's, that's the basic logic model, and it's, it, it, all that is happening anyway with susceptible strains, uh, and when they're resistant, it keeps happening the same way. And what makes them then of particular concern? Well, the, the, uh, here's a list of reasons, and this is sort of, there's a yin and a yang here. We think antibiotics are a good thing. We think antibiotics help improve health outcome. Well, then when there's resistance, you don't get that health outcome, things don't go as well. And if we believe antibiotics work, we should really have no trouble understanding that when they don't work, it's not as good, uh, treatment's not as good. And in fact, this list of problems probably could be identified for just about any antimicrobial resistance problem. This is a summary that comes from uh, a Danish epidemiologist who summarized them for specifically Salmonella and Campylobacter. But when treatment is needed, early empiric treatment may fail and treatment choices will be limited. There uh, have been a number of studies in a number of locations with a number of different organisms under study showing increased morbidity and mortality. That means illnesses may last longer, there may be more invasive infections, the person may be more likely to be hospitalized, and there may be more deaths associated with resistant infections than with susceptible infections. And in addition, there's one other issue which is much harder to substantiate and document, but when resistance is located on a mobile genetic element like those plasmids that I mentioned, it may be transferred to other bacteria horizontally and show up in other pathogens where you really don't want it. Now, there is another issue in this, not just that treatment doesn't work as well, which is sort of intuitively obvious if antibiotics are good, not having them work is not as good. And the second issue is that <clears throat> there is an effect, there's an interaction between being resistant and the antibiotics that someone might be taking for another reason. And this is based on a lot of epidemiologic observations and a very well-established animal model. Resistant strains have a selective advantage in, some, in, a, in an individual who is taking an antibiotic, an antimicrobial, for some other reason. If I am colonized with a resistant pathogen and I take a non, an antibiotic to which that organism is resistant, that may convert over to a, a silent colonization to overt disease. I think this happens in horses, if I understand it right, with salmonella and resistant salmonella. It certainly happens in humans. <clears throat> And that means you have then an illness in individuals that are already ill for other reasons, and it actually means you have more clinical cases since some of the silent colonizations are being converted to overt infections. And the proportion of illness that's attributable to resistance in the, by this mechanism has been estimated at between 3 and 26% for salmonella uh, by a, a, an infectious disease doctor in Boston named Barza uh, in this paper. And the midpoint of that is 58,000 more illnesses than would have occurred if either the people weren't taking any antibiotic or the salmonella wasn't resistant. Here is uh, one particular issue we've been tracking through NARMS, and that's ciprofloxacin resistance among Campylobacter jejuni from, from humans. Um, the first studies that were done uh, uh, back in 1989-90 that's some years after ciprofloxacin had been approved for human use, found 0% resistance at that point. Um, then subsequently fluoroquinolones were approved for use in poultry. And then in 1997, NARMS began, uh, and 12% uh, of Campylobacter were resistant to fluoroquinolone that first year, uh, and that rose steadily in the next few years. Uh, we did a number of uh, epidemiologic studies of this and associated that with two things. One was travel to other countries and picking up Campylobacter in other countries that was highly uh, resistant. And the second was uh, consuming uh, poultry. And, uh, and it was clearly also happening in poultry at the same time. Uh, the FDA uh, uh, withdrew poultry approval 
uh, in 2001, serofloxacin came off the market, and several years later, enrofloxacin did. And the rest of this story is still playing out. Uh, I think uh, it appears to me that maybe, maybe it, it stopped going up quite so much, uh, but it certainly didn't go away. It looks like we're going to have fluoroquinolone resistant Campylobacter for a long time. Non-typhoidal salmonella that we're tracking uh, and that is of concern to us, uh, particularly these days, is resistant to se resistance to ceftriaxone, the human drug, ceftiofur, the veterinary drug, uh, about 3% of all isolates. It depends on which serotype we're talking about. About 18% of isolates of Heidelberg, which is about the number three serotype in the country. Um, so that's an issue that's important to us. Uh, there's also a second issue, decreased susceptibility to ciprofloxacin. Uh, uh, again, 2.7% of all isolates now. Uh, about half of those were enteritidis. Now, when we've looked at these, most of those are in people who are coming back from overseas, and they're picking up that infection um, in another country, uh, presumably as a consequence of some antibiotic use. Don't really know what the use is or in, in who or what, but it's in another country. So I don't think that's coming from the domestic food supply. And then there are those uh, big problems uh, of the 90s, the DT-104 salmonella, the Newport that was so resistant, that had the, the big five-drug resistance uh, plasmids and so forth. And there's actually some good news there because that was 8% back in 2002 of all salmonella, and that's now down to just under 5%. And that high-level resistance, those, those, that penta resistance is actually dropping. It's dropped a little bit in typhimurium. It's dropped a lot in Newport. And that's actually going in the right direction. Here's uh, ceftriaxone resistance that we're observing now in Heidelberg over time from 1996 on to some very preliminary data from 2012. You can see the yellow bars are in humans, uh, a, a, an increase that varies a bit year to year, but um, currently 21% of Heidelberg in that most recent year not quite finished testing, and showing it in chickens um, from the USDA retail chicken, retail ground turkey. Again, it sort of, it bounces around year to year. The numbers are not big in any given year, but the general trend line <clears throat> of concern is upwards. Here is uh, uh, a really interesting set of observations from Quebec, where the same kind of resistance was tracked in Heidelberg, through a very similar system in Canada called uh, 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 CIFAR that uh, tracks resistance in, in foods and people. And there, the ceftriaxone resistant Heidelberg was very common in poultry meat. They didn't find any at all in beef or pork. Uh, and in 2005, the poultry industry in Quebec voluntarily halted using ceftiofur to treat eggs. Uh, and it had been routine to give it uh, in, injected into every egg. They stopped. And then here's what happened, and you can see several lines here that start dropping rapidly, including Heidelberg, the resistance, the percent resistance of Heidelberg and retail chicken, which went from about 50%, uh, uh, 40 percent down uh, uh, to close, below 10 percent. Uh, Heidelberg in humans drops, and then even they were looking at just generic E. coli in retail chicken, and uh, that's the line that's the highest of all and that drops the farthest. Then uh, after a little over a year, they, they, the use began a little bit, and they, they, they began doing partial, uh, using some ceftiofur, and it comes up a little. Uh, it doesn't go to the same high levels that it had been before, but it does uh, uh, return with the return of use. It's, it's, it gives me hope that um, we don't have to have ceft uh, <clears throat> this kind of resistance, um, that it, in fact it's responding to the pressure or the lack of pressure and, and it may be reversible. Now, we've done some studies in our lab that I want to share with you, a couple of studies. Here's one looking again at this triaxone ceftiofur resistance um, in strains uh, from humans, salmonella strains from humans, retail meat, and animals, finding that uh, actually humans, about 5% of our salmonella has this uh, retail meat, 16%, uh, animals, 11%, and it's a a number of different serotypes. <clears throat> there's overlap of the serotypes, I think, which is important. Uh, and there's, so there's overlap in the strains across sources. And this is then finding the same gene, that CMY gene, is in all three sources. 
and the same gene is appearing in a number of different serotypes as though it were moving around and capable of appearing uh, in a number of salmonella types. Well, that, that does seem to be, in fact, the case because we also did a study picking out just the Heidelbergs, which are the ones that have been concerned because of outbreaks, and, and it's also pretty common, and looking at the CMY gene <clears throat> in the Heidelbergs. Now, this gene, when it was first described, was on a plasmid that could easily transmit between Salmonella and E. coli. And when we went looking for it in the Heidelbergs, looking for Heidelbergs that were resistant to septiofure or ceftriaxone, um, 47 strains in 2009 in NARMS. This is from different sources, chicken or meat or, or, or a poultry meat or uh, 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 people. All 47 were on, this mo on a mobile plasmid, and 41 of the 47 plasmids were of the exact same type, uh, the ink type 1. <clears throat> there were two closely related versions of that. And uh, that same plasmid was found in a number of different Heidelberg strains. Uh, showing that it could be moving from one to another. Uh, and I, I'll just say that, and then 26 of the 29 animal and meat isolates with this gene were from chicken. So again, this is associating this particular kind of resistance and this mobile gene with, when it's in Heidelberg, with something from chicken. Now, I want to turn now and talk about a couple of the other issues that we have. Typhoid fever I mentioned. Here is a, a graph of the res partial resistance or total resistance to ciprofloxacin in typhoid fever in the United States from 1999 to 2011. It was, used to be only about 20%. It's now more than 70%. This is of enormous concern. Most of these are people traveling to India or Southeast Asia. And we are pushing with all of our, our travel medicine doctors, our travel medicine clinics, Anybody going to India or Southeast Asia, please get the typhoid fever vaccine. You don't want to get this infection. It's getting to be very hard to treat. So our alternative for this one, since there is a vaccine or two vaccines, is to really push the vaccine for people uh, on their, if they're traveling. Now, that doesn't help the people who live in India or live in Southeast Asia who are dealing with this as an everyday issue. Shigella, human disease, uh, human reservoir, uh, uh, has become resistant uh, already to some of the old standards like ampicillin or tetracycline or trimethoprim sulfa. And now we're seeing an increasing resistance to ciprofloxacin in Shigella, which we think is very likely related to the use of ciprofloxacin in, in people with this organism. And even, and just as worrisome, we're seeing after, after you can't use ciprofloxacin anymore, uh, then people start to use azithromycin and we're seeing an increase in resistance to azithromycin as well. There are problems in the other, other parts of the world that we encounter because travelers uh, go there or we import food from there. Uh, Campylobacter in Europe <clears throat> is, uh, is a big, has a lot of uh, cipro resistance. 52% of strains from humans, 50% of strains from poultry are cipro resistant. 80% of strains uh, in people who have traveled to other parts of the world and come back to Europe have cipro resistance. So um, our problem of 22, 23, 24 percent is really not as great as what they're encountering. Salmonella typhimurium and Salmonella enteritis in Eastern Africa uh, have uh, been causing really horrendous problems, sometimes in hospitals, uh, sometimes in communities, highly multiply resistant strains. Um, invasive infections with high mortality, acting like typhoid fever. In Taiwan, there's a problem with Salmonella cholera suis. This is a particular pathogen of people and of pigs. Uh, and there's been a real increase in human infections in the late 1990s, becoming extremely resistant, up to 60% cipro resistant, some also with that CMY2 gene that gives ceftriaxone resistance. This in people is a disaster. It's highly invasive. It presents with aortitis, an infection of the aorta or the aortic valve and septic shock. The pigs are having an epizootic with the same organism and the same lethal effects in the pigs. And what Taiwan is going to have to do is get control of this as an animal health problem and a human health problem at the same time. Salmonella, Kentucky. Pasteur Institute in Paris has been tracking Salmonella Kentucky of a particular strain that they first saw coming back 
in travelers to Tunisia in the 1990s, it was also travelers from Egypt. And in the 2000s, also travelers from India. So they're watching this strain spread across the developing world and become more and more resistant. Just in 2008, it appeared in Polish turkey flocks, in the meat from those flocks, and consumers who ate them. Since then, it's appeared in turkey flocks and meat in Germany and France. This has now become quite resistant. Here is the genetic profile, uh, the, 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 uh, sorry, the, path, the uh, resistance profile uh, to a number of different drugs, including ciprofloxacin, and sometimes also has the CMY2. So Europe is extremely concerned about this particular strain of salmonella. So CDC, I think, as we heard from Dr. Solomon is addressing the challenge of resistant infections in a number of ways, and we are focusing on the foodborne part of this by promoting prevention where we can, vaccinating people going to India, tracking resistance levels through our NARMS program, our collaborative effort with uh, USDA and with FDA, making that information more available more quickly so we have a website that has, uh, uh, now has a, a searchable uh, database. You can draw your own graphs with that website for NARMS data. Refining the estimates of the health impact of resistance, how many cases do we see? Uh, uh, making real-time resistance data part of outbreak investigations and better, trying to better understand sources and mechanisms of the resistance genes themselves and the resistant bacterial strains. I want to leave with a point about Shigella. Uh, to, to echo what uh, Dr. Solomon said about the real efforts within human medicine to try to deal with these problems. The management of Shigella infections in, children's, in children and in others has changed a lot. It was uh, often routine to uh, treat all cases very aggressively with antibiotics, no matter how mild, to treat any exposed family members, to uh, prophylax other children that were in the same child care center to use a whole lot of antibiotics in preventive mode. <clears throat> the result was a rapid increase in resistance to ampicillin, trimethoprim, sulfonalic acid, and so on. And in the 1990s, that routine was changed. We had long conversations with the, uh, the pediatricians of America and with other the family docs and said, look, reserve treatment for just the severe cases. That's who you really want to be able to treat. Reserve your antibiotics for those. For family members of a child with shigellosis, give them soap, give them hand-washing advice, tell them how they can prevent spread with soap and hand-washing, and, and in the child care center, isolate the old children and increase the hand-washing and, and other prevention measures. Don't rely on antibiotics as your prevention strategy because you're just going to make it resistant. Now, <clears throat> we need help addressing the public health concern about resistant foodborne infections that are zoonotic. Um, your expertise, the expertise in animal health and management, um, is, is absolutely vital in this. Um, you're, you are confronting the resistant problems of infections that are in pathogens that spread from animal to animal and make animals sick. I know that's part of everyday practice for, for all, of, all of you that are in the, the veterinary field. Um, we need your help to reduce the introduction of resistant strains into production with attention at the breeder stock levels, the hatcheries, animal feed sources, water environment employees, other things that may bring resistant strains into the production facility. We need your help to consider conditions that foster the selection of resistance and the spread of resistant organisms, um, like antibiotic use that is subtherapeutic, repeated, widespread, and, or unnecessary, and management practices that may spread illness, infection, or colonization among animals. And we need your help in the implementation of prevention measures, including judicious antimicrobial use, uh, 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 the application of alternate prevention steps like the kids uh, in daycare centers, and obviously to reduce food contamination with any pathogen, whether it's susceptible or resistant. So let me end by saying antibiotic resistance in foodborne infections, like a lot of other infections, is going to be a substantial challenge to human and animal health. The burden. <clears throat> While it's substantial, it's perhaps not irreversible. And we, we're seeing some declines, and I think more are possible. Uh, Non-judicious medical use is being addressed with major efforts focusing on the human medical community. Foodborne pathogens resistant to drugs that are important in human medicine, whether they're related to human use or agricultural use, are part of the public health picture. 
And we, want, uh, we need to limit the emergence of resistance and to prolong the effectiveness of current antibiotics with the judicious use for food animals <clears throat> supervised by a veterinarian and measures that prevent spread and food contamination because uh, consumers all, as you pointed out, we want our food to be safer, we want those who eat it to be healthier, and we want people to have confidence in our food supply. Thanks very much. Yeah.